Hey. Need a light? I'm, chat, I'm out of idea. That was that was that was. Bo I had a lighter there, bottom of the barrel intro. I I am I'm out. I'm out. You know, my brain's fried. My I my cells are gradually dying every single day, dude. That was it. That that's it. That was it. That was the intro. All right, fuck off. It was a typical day in the world of daytime television. Infomercials, soap operas, wow. and highly scripted Zoo legal pals. shows filled viewer screens. Judge Judy. With one of the more popular at the time being a program called Christina's Court. Today, I've never heard of that one. Court. The show centered around a woman named Christina Perez, giving counsel and advice to those wrapped up in legal drama. And on this particular morning, comedian Sean Harris would be featured filing suit against his ex-girlfriend in the hopes of recouping unpaid rent. In, every month it would be something different, you know? Like I'm what? Like, I ain't got it this month because I gotta do this or that. And I'm like, man. So I you mean, let her go nine months without paying rent? Now, like I said, these shows were very obviously scripted, at least to some degree. And with Sean himself being a professional comedian, it led to countless funny moments and what turned out to be one of the show's more iconic episodes. With by far the most memorable moment coming at the very end, when things seemed to deviate from the script. Constantly, like a child in People my own love, house. People love, they yell at each other all the time. Oh, but that's they true. Ask him, he's been married for how long? Over look at him years. though, he look mad. <laughs> you don't look happy, brother. You don't look happy. <laughs> Here, we see the comedian take aim at Christina's bailiff, a man. He he doesn't look happy with that comment named Renard Spivey, who was an integral part of the show, being the judge's sidekick for years and years. Though it wasn't often that he found himself at the end of a joke like this, as Sean suggests that Renard looked unhappy when it was revealed that he had been married for over 27 years. He's very happy. Okay, all right, let's get back to the point. All in all, it made for a rather charming moment, uh -oh. with viewers adoring the lighthearted jab aimed at one of the show's most beloved characters. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Though no one could have known at the time just how true that joke about his happy marriage would turn out to be. Oh. Oh. Tonight, a Harris County Sheriff's deputy facing serious charges. 63-year-old Renard Spivey accused of killing his wife, 52-year-old Patricia Spivey, after an argument that turned deadly. KPRC Channel 2's Bill Baraha. On July 28, 2019, over a decade after the aforementioned program aired, Renard Spivey was confronted by his wife Patricia about what she believed to be steroid use or perhaps even infidelity. And in the midst of this heated argument, Spivey would draw his gun and shoot his wife once in the arm and then in the chest. Shortly after, police would find her lifeless body crumpled in their bedroom closet. Now, after years and years of taking part in this once famed legal show, Spivey can be found alone in his prison cell where he'll likely remain for the next 14 years of his life for murdering the woman that he was so happily married to turning what was once one of Christina's court's most iconic moments into one of the dark- Dude, I don't know. Like, anyone that's that ripped, you know, anyone that's, like, that buff, I always, like, you know, I'm concerned. I'm always concerned. Because you know that, they, that mentally, a lot of times, they're not okay. When people are, like, roided out of their minds, a lot of times it does a big number on their mental state. And, you know- Roid rage and shit. And I don't know. People with like huge muscles always scare me. Not always. It depends on them as a person. But a lot of times. Darkest examples of irony in all of television history. When you find a good woman, you gotta hang on for dear life. 
is that it's hard to find another one. So my advice as a happy woman, married woman. Before we get any further, I want to thank Scentbird for sponsoring this video and in turn making hey, this- Hey, I was just sponsored by them too. Use my code! But you could also use Crowley's code because I don't know if my- I assume my code's still active, but you know. <clears throat> play- play Overwatch 2 while Watch think I'll win? Uh, probably not. Because the ranking system is all over the place. Chat, I'm- 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 I'm Diamond 4. Right now, I'm Diamond 4. I'm headed to Masters. Not trying to brag or anything. But me and my wife are, are headed to Masters. No one cares. I'm talking to myself. No one gives a the shit The world of television is an interesting one. Despite the highly controlled and well-polished products that we're typically used to seeing on our screens, there have been a surprisingly high number of deeply disturbing moments that have happened when on air. And this potentially new series aims to highlight some of the most disturbing. And what better way to start than with a rel- Wait, what? Are, wait, is someone saying Scentbird's a scam now? Chat, every fucking sponsor's a scam. All right, just get over it. I don't know. Relatively unknown case that has haunted me for years. <laughs> Saturday, June 14th, 2008. A Japanese TV station called Television Miyazaki is running oh, its okay, standard good. live programming, which on this day was, was set to, to feature mad. a game show-like segment <laughs> in the remote rice fields of Takachi Hocho. The game itself was simple. Competitors stood back to back on a small wooden stand above the shallow muddy water below. And when given the cue, they would attempt to shove their opponent into the water without turning their bodies around. In the end, the one left standing on the platform would be declared the winner, with the loser being left humiliated in the mud. <laughs> Round one goes off without a hitch, resulting in the losing contestant being covered head to toe in a thick no. brown sludge. With the whole atmosphere perfectly encapsulating the craziness and high energy charm that you would expect from a Japanese game show made at the time. And so far, everything was all in good fun. With this excitement only escalating as the contestants convince one of the show's hosts, a man named Tasuchi Yanagida, to join in on the competition. <laughs> It took some convincing, but eventually Tetsuchi agrees to compete, okay. much to the enjoyment of everyone spectating. I'm, I'm getting nervous And from there, now. the comedy writes itself, as immediately after the round starts, it's apparent that he stood little to no chance. <laughs> And upon instantly losing his balance, Tasuki reacts in a split second and dives off the platform, landing. Did he break his neck? Head first into the muddy water below, which causes his body to fall limp. The water that he had just dove into was merely six inches deep, with Oh God. Oh God. Six inches deep and the man dives head first. With the rest consisting of a thick layer of mud, which his head would strike directly instantly causing his neck to break. And in that very moment, Tatsuchi would be irreversibly paralyzed, leaving him unable to move from the neck down. It was a tragic accident. However, the accident itself is far from the most awful part of this live broadcast, with that coming immediately after. Unaware of Tatsuchi's severe- Oh no. Did they let him drown? injury, the crew believed that he was merely playing a prank on them and just joking around, and so they left him there, 
face first in the water and proceeded to shove his face even deeper and deeper into the mud, splashing even more on top of his head to rub in the fact that he had lost. They had no idea that during their antics, Hasuchi was in a desperate fight for survival, as in those six inches of water, he was slowly drowning and completely unable to pick up his head to breathe. This lasts for an excruciatingly long 15 seconds before they begin to bob his head up and down and eventually pull Tasuchi's face out of the water. But this reprieve was short-lived as the contestants proceed to drop him back into the mud face first. <laughs> It is so incredibly painful to watch, and made all the more disturbing with the over-the-top hysterical laughter coming from everyone around him who are completely oblivious to the situation in front of them. Finally, after what feels like an eternity, Tasuchi is hoisted above the water and the camera switch back to the main broadcast, ending both Tasuchi's and the viewer's pain. By some stroke of good fortune, Tasuchi would survive the ordeal. Oh, thank God he actually lives. Oh, I thought he was going to die. Oh, God. I thought he was going to, like, drown because they were just going to leave him. <clears throat> but just barely, as it's estimated that even just a few more seconds in that mud would have likely led to his death. But thankfully, this wasn't the case. And according to his Facebook page, Tasuchi has learned to live with his body-wide paralysis, and even went on to rejoin the show years later in some capacity, ending this entry off on somewhat of a bright spot, despite this otherwise being oh one God. of the more unsettling and appalling broadcast Dude, accidents that, one was hard. that I've ever seen. Silly goofy guy, stop play drowning, silly goose. Oh, man. Like, you almost, like, the thing is, you can't really blame everybody else. Because they were just, you know, doing the show. Being overactive. Like, oh, you're funny. But to be fair, if you if you are a human being and you see the man dive head first into six inches of mud, you probably think that he hurt himself. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Donald Herbert had been in a coma for the previous... On the topic of broadcasts that have left an impression on my life, I would say none have had more of an emotional impact than a story run by 60 Minutes about a man named Donald Herbert. The story starts back in 1995, just four days after Christmas, when a fire broke out in a home in Buffalo, New York. In an attempt to put out the blaze, firefighter Donald Herbert was standing on the roof of the building when suddenly it, it gave collapsed. way. As a result, Herbert would fall into the attic where he would be trapped in the smoke, unable to breathe. He would lay there without oxygen for six whole minutes before they finally were able to pull his body to safety, with the whole ordeal being filmed and shown on local news. Somehow, Herbert managed to survive this accident, but being without air for that long caused him to lose most of his brain function, leading to him spending the following years in a minimally conscious state, unable to eat, unable to breathe, oh and seemingly unable to understand the world around him. Eventually, his condition led to him being placed in a nursing home, where a feeding tube was the only thing keeping him alive. For all intents and purposes, the man was gone. But then, something happened. On April 20th, 2005, a staggering nine and a half years after his accident, Donald Herbert woke up. Oh my, I've seen this. Oh, didn't he, okay. Didn't he like wake up, but he died like really shortly after? He was like able to say hi to everyone and stuff and then he dies. I think I've seen In this. the nursing home where he had spent most of the years unresponsive, he would suddenly turn to a nurse and ask for his wife, Linda, while displaying signs of being fully lucid, which prompted the staff to immediately call his family Pig who spoiling. rushed- spoiling? Shut up, okay? Yes, okay, I'm sorry. I spoiled it, all right? I'm sorry. ...to see him. Ban me. And sure enough, it's my despite fault. Herbert being up. completely blind, I've seen he was not one. only fully responsive, but recognized almost all of his family members. The moments following were all captured by cameras and later shown on an episode of 60 Minutes, with the footage being some of the hardest hitting and emotional that I've personally ever seen. <laughs> 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 
The pain in discovering that he had been gone for 10 years, all that God. time missed, robbed from a man who was just doing his job, is indescribably gut-wrenching. But it's what happens after this footage. Chat, get over it! One time! One time! Get over it! All right, I, one time I spoil a goddamn video. That's it, all right. That proves to be the most upsetting part. For nearly 16 hours, the newly awakened man spoke with his family, catching up on every little detail that he had missed. And though from that point on, he had moments going in and out of his lucidity, his long-term prognosis actually seemed hopeful. Throughout the next few weeks, Donald was surrounded by family members at all times, not only to take advantage of every single second that Herbert was awake, but also for his own safety as well. As since his awakening, he would thrash violently in his sleep, as if he still believed he was trapped in that blaze. And so to ensure his safety, at least one family member would be stationed with the man while he slept. Though on one night, one of the family members on duty had grown too exhausted to stay any longer, and from the first time since he became lucid, Donald Herbert was left alone. And during that night, he would again start to thrash violently, with Herbert flailing so hard that he would fall out of his bed and strike his head against the floor, causing his brain to start bleeding. From that moment on, Donald Herbert would never become lucid again, and as a result of his injuries, he would pass away one year later from pneumonia. Okay, to be fair, I didn't know that that was the way he died. I didn't know that. Imagine being the family member that left. Imagine being that family member. If anyone had ever thought that such a horrendous thing could happen, obviously- But to be fair, if if I'm ever in a state like that where I'm like a potato, bruh, just pull the plug. Like being in a in like a, a, a non like functioning lucid state for ten years, bruh, just pull the plug. Obviously we would have stopped. Holy shit. The Twilight Zone. Throughout its lengthy run, this television series provided some of the most entertaining and memorable moments in all of television. But for this section, I'm going to be cheating a little bit, as rather than looking at an event surrounding the show itself, I'll be highlighting the far less memorable movie version of the series. Simply named Twilight Zone the Movie, the film was broken up into multiple sections serving as sort of an anthology work with three separate storylines. And for the sake of this story, only one section and really only one scene bears discussion. The scene was intended to simulate a battle in the Vietnam one, War Chad, so in which the protagonist, it. a character played by actor Vic Morrow, is attempting to outrun an attack helicopter and escape the area. The footage was intended to serve as the section's dramatic conclusion, with it being described as the following. In the scene that served as the original ending, Bill, the character portrayed by Maro, stumbles into a deserted Vietnamese village, where he finds two young Vietnamese children left behind when a U.S. Army helicopter appears and begins shooting at them. Maro was to take both children under his arm and escape out of the village as the hovering helicopter destroyed the village with multiple explosions. Based on that description alone, shooting the scene was going to be tricky and likely a very intense process on the set, as all the effects used were set to be done practically, meaning that they would require an actual helicopter and real pyrotechnics. Not only this, but the director, a man named John Landis, wanted to use actual child actors for the scene, which oh, given that no. it was planned to take place at night and near explosions, was technically illegal in the state of California. Despite the laws in place, however, Landis decided to shoot the scene regardless, enlisting seven-year-olds Mika Din Lee and six-year-olds Renee Sheen Yi Chen. Hmm, why are they covered in like burn marks? Chen to play the roles of the Vietnamese children. And with all the pieces now in place, the cameras began to roll on what was set to be the stunning conclusion to this particular section. As the scene starts, the spectacle of it all can't be understated, as the lighting, setting, and the pyrotechnics truly set a haunting tone. However, unbeknownst to the production team, there was a major problem developing. 
As stated prior, all the effects you see here are real, and during the scene, there was an actual helicopter flying just above the actors, which by itself was already very dangerous, and made even more so due to the pyrotechnics. For the pilots, the explosions launched in the air created fireballs in the sky, making things much more difficult to navigate, but those on the ground were never made aware of this, and being pressed to make things look even more and more intense, the crew decided to double down on their explosions, launching two massive charges back to back. Jesus a decision that proved to be a costly one, as the second blast was so strong that it dislodged the helicopter's tail prop, causing the craft to spin uncontrollably. And within mere seconds, as the cameras roll on the three actors trudging their way through the water, craft crashes directly on top of them. Somehow, everyone on board the helicopter survived the wreck, though those on the ground weren't so lucky, as in one split second, the blade of the helicopter slashed into Vic Morrow and Mika Din Lee, instantly decapitating them. And as the craft slammed to the ground, Renee Shin Yi Chen would be crushed beneath its massive weight. Wait, this is actually, like, they use this scene? In one frame, there were three living actors, and in the next, there were none. In retrospect, it's not hard to see the red flags and the dangerous practices being used by the production team. However, No, the whole part was cut? Oh, it's just production footage? Okay. Following several long legal battles, no one would be found liable in the deaths of the three actors, and Landis himself would go on to enjoy an incredibly successful career. The Twilight Zone film would eventually be released years later, only he didn't get in trouble for any of that? With a different ending. Oh, they're not gonna demolish it. There's nobody will come in here. I'll fight force with force. So three people died, two of them decapitated, two of them children. No one got in trouble. No one? No one at all? No one got nothing? No? Okay. Our final the man, story the takes- The man has three deaths on his conscience, goes on to just have a good career. Okay. Just to the quaint countryside of Buttsfield, England, where a man named Elbert Dryden had been living a fairly solitary life. Following his retirement from steelworking, Elbert dedicated his life to building up a plot of land which he had purchased in the area. His main goal was to construct a bungalow for his elderly mother where she could live during the summers, while also planning to build some sort of fallout bunker on the same plot. But right from the start, he ran into issues, as his permit request to build these structures on his land was promptly denied. Why is everyone this did no. not stop Dryden, however, no, as no, despite no. the ruling, he began his construction anyway, believing he had found a workaround with the law, as rather than building the house in a standard manner, he instead dug a deep hole into the ground and began to construct his home there, labeling it as the home in a hole. Due to this, the home only stood about eight feet or so above the ground, which Dryden believed made the construction legal. However, he was wrong in his assumption, and the building swiftly caused a disagreement between the man and the Derwentside District Council, with this rift growing more and more amplified as time went on. In the midst of this ordeal, a man named Harry Collinson was appointed as chief of the council and assigned to handle the case as his first order of business. And he did so by initially sending Dryden a letter demanding that he stop construction and also tear down what he had already built. Dryden, however, decided to counter with a court appeal, which was swiftly denied, leading to the court's final order that the building be demolished within three months. It was around the same time that the local news began to document the ongoing feud between Dryden and the government, and despite the numerous rulings against him, Dryden still refused to give in to the government's demands, and eventually, the council decided to take matters into their own hands, and decided to demolish the structure themselves. So on June 20th, 1991, Harry Collinson, a demolition team, and a group of police constables traveled to Dryden's property to demolish the structure. Before this group arrived, the decision was made that should Dryden attempt to escalate the situation, they Was he in the house? ...were to immediately back Whenever off and come up with another plan to avoid any sort of physical altercation. 
At the scene, numerous reporters had already began gathering at the property line, including a cameraman for the BBC, who was there to document the feud in real time. And right from the start, it was clear that Dryden was not going to be going down without a fight. The gate to his property was chain-locked, with Dryden standing behind it, pointing to two letters that he believed proved that he should be able to keep his structure intact, at least for the time being. Read that, that's an official letter, and there's an appeal in. There's an inspector coming out on this site in five weeks' time. Well, it doesn't say that. I'm ready to say Well, that. I have another letter but confirming that. I'm letter. not going to show you the other letter, but I, there's a, there's a, this chap's coming out in five weeks' time. Well, all is I'm asking is to wait five weeks for the outcome, maybe six weeks. It'll take a week after he's been out. I'm trying to find out that there's nothing in these documents that affects the legality well, of the enforcement notice that the well, inspector he, has confirmed. Well, the, yes, Harry. However, Dryden's request for more time was clearly falling on deaf ears. And realizing this, Dryden began to grow more and more agitated, uh -oh. with his tone quickly turning far more menacing. Uh -oh. If you don't open the gate, now we'll, have to, we'll obviously have to take the fence down with the machine. So, if you want, you can have uh -oh. some time to remove the fence yourself to minimize the damage. Do you want to do that? Any damage that's subsequently caused as a result of you... He's gonna, he's gonna go crazy, is your, your liability. Well, you might not be around to see the outcome of this disaster. Now, you've been warned. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I'm not gonna explain, but if you had any sense, you would go away now and wait five weeks for the outcome of that, right? That's my last word on it. Could you show me the letter referring I to the final? Thank you, Slurp. We yes, will come to told you where the letter is. At this point, based on their initial plan, the crew should have certainly turned back, as it was now getting to the point that Dryden was outright threatening Collinson, warning him that if he were to step on his property, that something awful was going to happen. And though this did cause Collinson to take a few steps back, he still remained steadfast in carrying out the task and remained on the edge of the property line, standing his ground even when Dryden escalates the situation even further. What the Lord don't know? Go ahead. Someone's gonna get shot. And you got a shot at this gun. As the two stand face to face, Dryden brandishes his pistol and points it directly at Collinson. And wanting to ensure the man's combative behavior was being documented, Collinson asks the cameraman to get a shot of his gun, which subsequently leads to this moment. Can you get a shot of this gun? Out of it! In an instant, with cameras rolling, Dryden fires a shot directly into the chest of Harry Collins. Wow. He did not give a fuck, did he? And then fires another at the crowd standing before him, leading to things devolving into a chaotic scene of running and screaming. <clears throat> As more shots were fired from a pistol, the camera crew and Look North reporter Tony Belmont ran for cover. We were standing, we were standing watching what was going on, and then a, a shot rang out at the chief planner, fell to the ground, and I, uh, I heard, felt a shot in the arm, and I've clearly been shot here in the arm. As the camera crew finally gets to a safe distance and- Wow, that is a very, very calm. Oh, it seems I've been shot in the arm. Damn, dude, this, I mean, maybe he's just in shock, so he's not feeling much of the pain, but he was just like, oh yeah, it seems I've been shot in the arm. Everything's all right, though. <clears throat> and catches their breath. It's revealed that one of the journalists for the BBC had been struck in the arm, along with one of the officers. Though in the midst of all this carnage, we see no sign of Harry Collinson as by this point, he was likely still on the ground where he had originally fallen, dead from his gunshot wound, with his final words being, Can you get a shot at this gun? Out of it! Following the incident, police would engage in a standoff with Dryden, who claimed that he had set up booby traps and landmines, along with other explosives on the property, though this what would turn out fuck? to be a bluff, and eventually okay, I was he would about be grabbed by officers and taken into custody, <coughs> where he would subsequently be tried. Yeah, Amy, the tacos are like really fucking good, by the way. Yeah, these are really good. Tried and sentenced to life in prison. 
And despite his actions on that day, Albert Dryden would go on to become somewhat of a national hero, growing a legitimate fan base for the way he stood up against the government. Dryden I mean, would live out his- Yeah, like, I guess good on him for standing his ground, but you know, maybe don't kill a guy. Maybe don't kill a guy for it. Like, sure, it probably was ridiculous for the government to come over and be like, hey, we're going to tear down your house that you spent a lot of time building. But, uh, yeah, maybe don't, uh, maybe don't shoot him. Maybe don't kill a guy. ...time in prison until 2017 when he suffered a yeah, massive just stroke, to which just he was maybe. let out on a compassionate release, with a man eventually passing away just one year later. Though his actions that day will forever be immortalized as one of the most notorious and darkest moments in television history. I want to give a big thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Make sure Man. to- See you, chat. That's why you never fuck with crazy people. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribe? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. I hope you return. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.